You did want water, didn't you? Oh, uh, it's okay. You know, yeah, grab me some water, okay? I need to get some stuff under there here. That's my card. I know I introduced myself to you at your house, but my name is Lisa Reeves, okay? And I am a detective here at the Charlottesville Police Department. Okay. So before I can even, I want to talk to you, I want to make sure you do understand your rights, okay? And that way I can explain to you what's going on and all that good stuff. Do you okay. understand You understand yes. that? Okay. Today's date is May the 3rd, 2010. The current time is... All right, your first name is George. Yes. G-E-O-R-G. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I did it. There's no way I did it. You, no way. Why did you guys say, why did you guys come in and say you, you were searching for an assault? I never said anything about an assault. Someone, someone came in this morning. I never mentioned to you anything. Just told you we're investigating someone. To know investigating so. Do you want me to call anybody for you, George? It's an interesting concept to think of how you might respond to what would normally be an easy question, especially during a circumstance where it becomes a terrifying dilemma. We ask that you contemplate this question while you put yourself in George's position, but not before you grasp the context of what brought him to this moment. It begins with 22-year-old sports scholar Yardley Love, a star lacrosse player at the University of Virginia. She is captured in this photograph playing in the second-to-last game of the season, clearly aware of the obstacles that lie in front of her, yet continuing to move forward, which is the circumstantial detail that turned this picture into a symbol for the globally recognized organization that would be founded in her memory. This would be the last photograph taken that day, capturing Yardley's last embrace with her head coach Julie Myers. Both were unaware this exact moment would soon be on the national front pages. On May 3, 2010, at roughly 2.15 a.m., Yardley's roommate returned from a night out to their off-campus apartment. Upon entering, she saw that Yardley's bedroom had been broken into, at which point she rushed inside to find her unresponsive on the mattress. She had blood coming out of her nose and severe bruising across the right side of her face. But the most alarming thing was that she wasn't waking up. Her friend called 911, who instantly guided her through the steps of CPR, which was then taken over by paramedics who arrived on the scene four minutes later. But their attempts at revival were unsuccessful, and Yardley was pronounced dead at exactly 2.47 a.m. At 2.53 that same morning, criminal investigator Lisa Reeves woke up to a phone call from the sheriff's office. By 2.59, she had arrived at Yardley's apartment leading the investigation, and by 3.50, confirmed that she had her first person of interest, which was 22-year-old George Hughley V. Yardley's ex-boyfriend, and the next several hours were spent gathering information before she knocked at his front door. She found out that George was a fifth-generation heir to a very wealthy American family, whose roots lay in lumber dating back to the 1900s. He was educated at Landon Prep, a prestigious all-boys private school in Bethesda, Maryland, with annual tuition fees of up to $50,000. George was the star player of the lacrosse team and became an All-American athlete. This led to a full scholarship at the University of Virginia, where he remained a key player in the starting lineup, and where he would also meet, then spark a romance with fellow lacrosse player Yardley Love. They dated for almost two years. Hughley and Love's relationship was an on-again, off-again one, where they cheated on each other throughout, and that tempers flared both ways. What was going on with these two young people? What may have led someone to do what happened? These are just a completely unbelievable set of facts. Everybody watched the relationship. People were really troubled by it. They were scared for her. Nobody knew what to do. Yardley ended the relationship in 2010, just two weeks before graduation. Nine days later, she was found dead in her bedroom. And that same morning, George Hughley would hear a knock at his front door. He opened to Detective Lisa Reeves, who was dressed in civilian clothing. She introduced herself as a police officer, but mentioned nothing of the crime. She simply stated that she was conducting an investigation that could benefit from his presence at the sheriff's office. George's response was to lethargically put on his flip-flops, then walk over to the passenger side door of her unmarked police car and let himself in. Somewhat bewildered, Lisa got in and drove them to the police station a few minutes away without talking. It was around then when she noticed bruising on his knuckles and cuts on his forearm, at which point George was no longer a person of interest. He was the prime suspect. All right, George. Did you say you were 
you did want water, didn't you? I know I introduced myself to you at your house, but my name is Lisa Reeves. Today's date is May the 3rd, 2010. The current time is, I you know, can't tell on that one, 7.52. Okay? My trial papers too. What's that? My trial is paper still right now. Yeah. All right, your first name is George? Yes. Right away you'll come to notice that George is oblivious to the gravity of his situation, and it would be very safe to assume that he at this moment is unaware that Yardley has died. He seems to believe that he's in as much trouble as he would be sitting in a principal's office, perhaps for getting in a fight at class or on the lacrosse field, and the sooner he provides a sanitized version of the truth, the sooner he'll get to go home. This of course ties in perfectly with the interrogator's opening strategy which we've labeled warmth for the sake of this video. She will downplay the severity of his situation to a considerable degree, while maintaining a friendly temperament with a sympathetic undertone. She needs the suspect to feel safe and secure for the time being, as the less cautious he is, the more information he's likely to give away. Then as soon as he locks himself into one particular storyline, the pressure can commence, which often leads to a suspect being laden with panic and contradictions. Before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before questioning and have one present during questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. And if you're willing to talk to us now, you have the right to stop talking any time. George has two options here. Option one is to remain silent, then allow his father to get him the most expensive attorneys in the country. He would then have years to examine the evidence, evaluate the many options available, and then construct the most self-preserving storyline with world-renowned experts in criminal defense before they present it to a jury. Unfortunately for George, he takes option two. But before he does, re-watch the flawlessly reassuring manner in which he's given the final piece of the Miranda warning. And if you're willing to talk to us now, you have the right to stop talking any time. Got it? Yep. Awesome. Just need your signature there that you understand your rights and are willing to talk to us. And the time now is 7.53. All right. Let's kind of start. I'm going to kind of ask you some questions and Alexa will explain things a little bit later. Um, tell me about your day yesterday. Played golf with um, our parents. It was a... Uh, a father son uh, good event I went to dinner with my dad and my two buddies and then uh, went home went to the bar for like a little while um, then I went over to talk to Yardley and who's Yardley? Yardley what, is my former girlfriend okay which this whole thing's about which I understand but George has now initiated the investigative subject matter himself. It's the perfect opening scenario for the interrogator because she's given nothing away, making it more likely for him to reveal details that will contradict the evidence. When I went over to talk to Yardley, I, I like was like, Yardley? And she was like, already f like totally freaked out because of what she did this past like a few days ago and she, we haven't talked since and I was just going to go talk to her. Mm -hmm. Yardley slept with another lacrosse player from North Carolina the week before, which is what he just referred to. And she was already like, oh, like freaking out. Like, you know, you can't go, you can't go. And I was like, I'm like just trying to talk to you. The investigation team obviously had no way of knowing this, and George has now confessed to the crime of second-degree trespass. More importantly, however, he's just confessed to initiating the supposed confrontation. He now can't say that he was somehow tricked or misled into that situation. He knowingly stepped into it, and the critical fact he can actually recognize and remember this will be used against him repeatedly in the future. And, like, she, like, started being, like, like getting, like, all, like, you know, like really like defensive. She was already like on the defensive edge. And like, I was like, listen, I'm not here to like, I'm just here to talk to you. And she like got all like, like sat up, like her bed's against the wall. Like if it was in this corner, she was like up against the wall. And I was like, like we were sitting there talking and like she started being like, like, you know, like getting like all like, aggressive after this and so I was like all right like chill out like and shook her a little bit 
So just to recount what George said over the last 47 seconds, Yardley was defensive. While being in a defensive state, she backed up against the wall. She then became aggressive. George's response to this supposed aggression was to initiate physical contact. And she started being like, like freaking out. And I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything. I'm here to talk to you about everything that's ensued in the past week. And, and she was like, and like sort of like, being like, no, 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 like, like hitting her head, like, st like stop, like, like she's in the corner, I was sitting on the bed, I was like, stop, like, I was like, we were like, like, what the hell, like, we were just gonna talk. So let's go back half a minute and dissect what actually just happened there. And so I was like, all right, like, chill out, like, and shook her a little bit. He will now say the words, and she started being like, then simultaneously mimic a body colliding with the wall. He will then stop himself mid-thought and subtly modify the detail. And she started being like, like freaking out, and I was like, listen. And she started being like, like freaking out. He goes from illustrating Yardley hitting the wall, to as he states, freaking out. And she he seems to realize mid-sentence, this isn't the best way to explain her injuries, so he changes the detail to buy himself time. And she started being like, like freaking out, and I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything, I'm here to talk to you. He carefully shifts the topic from Yardley to himself, and keeps it there for eight seconds before attempting to re-explain what occurred in a more self-preserving manner. And she was like, and like, sort of like, being like, no, 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 like, like hitting her head, like, no jury on the planet will believe that Yardley was voluntarily slamming her head against the wall with enough force to cause fatal brain damage. All George has done here is give away the fact that he knows Yardley has sustained some type of head injury and now lied on record about how it was inflicted. I was like, Yardley, like, what the hell? Like, we were just going to talk. And, like, it was not at all, like, a good conversation because that's, like, she was already, like, freaking out with just even seeing me. Just even see me there. Okay. What happened next? What happened next? And she just kept hitting her head against the against the wall while she was sitting on the bed. And I was like, and I grabbed her and I like shook her. I was like, stop! Like we need to like and looked at her. I was like, we need to like talk about this. And like, I mean, I was on holding her arms and stuff, but like, I I never struck her. I never like hit her hit her like in the face or anything i was just like we need to talk and she was so like she was so like oh i mean what's the word like you know like like flop a fish out of the water like like so like all this and i was like listen like i'm not here to like fight with you or like do anything like I'm here to talk to you and like and she's like no no, no like get away from me you have to leave, you have to leave, you, you have to leave, you have to leave, you have to leave, like, all this stuff. And I was like, all right, like, fine, like, but, like, I want to talk to you after all this. And, and like, I was, I was, like, a little bit persistent because of the situation, you know, my former girlfriend who, like, something happened last week, you know, and I was like, all right, like, well, so we were, like, talking over there, and... I mean, I, somehow we ended up, uh, somehow I was resting at her on the floor, and I was just like, stop, I just, like, and I was holding her. I was holding her. I was a little bit persistent. I was wrestling her on the floor. All further evidence that designates George as the aggressor. He's completely shut down his ability to argue any sort of self-defense claim. And then the conversation I could tell was just like, it was not going anywhere, and nothing was happening, and... Oh, uh, she like went back to bed and I and I left. And I went back home. Okay. Phase one is now complete. The suspect has unknowingly locked himself into a storyline that will put him away for a very long time. The risk of him shutting down or requesting a lawyer is no longer a primary concern. So the interrogator will now increase the pressure. She will confront him on certain elements that she pretended to overlook before. And the ideal scenario is to cause just enough panic so that he backpedals on previous statements and contradicts himself. Alright, so you go over there. Knock on the door. Her front door is open. Mm -hmm. Her room door was closed. I knock like, like, are they like, she heard me open the door and, and went in. Alright. Went in where? To her room. All right, straight to her bedroom? Straight to her bedroom, yeah, I mean... How'd you get through the door? Her door or the mm -hmm. front door? Her door. 
Actually, it might have been locked. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Just, just the odds. Like yeah, no, yeah. It, it was actually it was locked. Yeah, because yeah. I think I put a hole. Yeah, you punched door. a hole through the door. Pretty sure, actually, now. Yeah, that okay. you said that. Yeah. All right. Pretty what, sure. What, why'd you do that? You well, I, I guess. Yeah, when I once I was in her room, she was like very like you know like hardly do like, I don't want to talk to you like all this stuff. And she was very like, you know, very on edge, like, I don't want to talk, like, I don't want to talk, like, uh, you know? Okay. I was like, listen, like, you, what you pulled last week was outrageous. Like, I just want to talk to you. And Why'd you push the door there? A very unusual time to interrupt a suspect in such a contentious manner. He was giving away self-incriminating information that could be used to establish a motive. He was doing exactly what the lead investigator wanted. But Detective Ed has now stopped him in his tracks. It's a reckless maneuver at this point in the interrogation, which Detective Reeves is no doubt conveying at this moment through nonverbal communication. She now has to let the suspect respond as to not undermine their position. Because I want to talk to her. Detective Reeves will now bring his guard back down through a reassuring tone and gently guide his train of thought back to his grievances with the victim. She pulls this off in three questions. All right, we'll continue on. That's fine, continue on. So you're, you're talking to her and she doesn't want to talk to you? Not really. I mean, and, I mean we talked, though. We, like, there was parts where we were talking and then, like... Do you know what you're talking about? I mean, about so many different things. Okay. Like what? Like, like what she did last week, mm -hmm. like went to like Carolina. She went to Carolina and hooked up with someone Sunday when we were still trying to figure out things. And I was over there like, like to talk, like, I was like, this is like, this is outrageous. Because I was trying to make everything better. And, and then like, you know, she was very defensive because she knew like how upset I was. Cause I've told her like through emails, like, how upset I was, like, about what she did. And so I was like, and I sat on the edge of bed, I was like, listen, like, I want to talk to you, like, like, what you did was bullshit. Like, that was, that's not, like, okay. And I was just like, I, like, and, and she was like, oh, like, not like, like, you know, she's like, uh, like, you know, sort of pushing everything that she did to the back burner and, like, talking about, like, like, you know, like, they like, tried to like put everything that she did like wasn't important. It kept going to the point where she like I was like, listen, like you're like we have to figure like out what's going on. And she was like, I'm not I'm not to I'm not talking to you and then she like pushed me, be like, get out of here. Like like go. And I was like, no, and like I was like be like, we have to talk, like so, like get like when you when you're doing that, what what are you holding on her? On For her arms. On her arms, like maybe up here? Like shoulders, yeah. Shoulders. Like, 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 come on, like, you know, and see, that's when she was like, wiggle, and like, like, get away, and like, you know, like, hide in the, get in the corner, like, really, like, aggressive, like, defensively, almost. And, and then I was, and then she ended, I think she was back in bed, and I was, and I left, I was like, oh, this is the, not going anywhere. How'd she get back in bed? Uh, we were like wrestling and we stood up and I, I tossed her, I pushed her onto the bed. I was like, go to bed, like, I'll talk to you later. Did you touch her neck area at all? Did you choke her at one point? Um, I may have grabbed her a little bit by the neck mm -hmm. when we were like, but I never like strangled her. Okay. okay. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, during the whole like commotion, you know, like I we may have I might have grabbed her neck, but I never was there, never was like strangling her. Okay. More detail that was unknown to the investigation. The fact that he grabbed her neck can now be used as evidence. It paints a more frightening picture of the incident with relation to the suspect's aggression toward the victim. This was an extremely damaging revelation for George's defense. The discussion moves to the moment he left, and George admits that he took Yardley's laptop. Why'd you grab her laptop? Because I was so pissed that she wouldn't talk to me. I was like, 
I don't know. I don't like took it almost as like collateral, I guess. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's it's not reasonable logic, but right. Okay. I don't know. Did you take I mean, anything else besides no, the laptop? No. Nothing. No. Okay. I mean. All right. So when um uh, when you left out of there, I mean, you saw that she was bleeding on her nose. She's now about to ask a question with the same implication for a second time. Notice what occurred the first time. Did you go back and check on her at any point? No, I did not. Okay. Did, mm -hmm. did you try to call rescue or anything to make sure she's all right? No, I did not. No. Why? The face of bewilderment, if there ever was one. It's very strange that he's so taken aback by such a question, especially when you take into account the possible outcome if he had actually called for help. One medical expert revealed in the courtroom for the very first time that following Yardley Love's brutal beating, had George Hughley or anyone else called for help, she might have survived. Uh, I didn't think it was like, in, I didn't think that she was like, in need of like going to the emergency room, I th she just got. I mean, a play. What do you think that? I don't know. I mean, I. I did, did you say when you were? And correct me if I'm wrong. When you were shaking her, her head was hitting the wall. Well, that was in the beginning. That was in initially when I walked in. Like she was like up in the corner, like saying, "Get like get out of here," like you know, like this. Mm -hmm. like, at, at any time when you were shaking her, did her head bang the the wall? Put yourself in George's position and imagine Yardley had in fact self-inflicted her injuries. You would perhaps say something along the lines of, absolutely not. I wasn't hitting her against the wall, but like, when she's uh, like sitting there in the corner mm -hmm. of like, if it were like, or like, like this, and I'm like, or they like, you know, and I, I was like, 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 what the fuck was that about? Like, that, that's such bullshit that you like do that, like, that's such a, like, bullshit move like what would, would like you know like ever like he never like what are you like doing like like that like okay. she she has a pretty good knot on her head that's why i'm asking how uh, that how, how you can explain how that would have happened i mean i don't even know when that a knot mm -hmm. i mean like on, on the side of her head she's been hit pretty good right there so i'm just trying to figure out did you hit her with something no was that no, her i never i never wall? never touched her or struck her or anything well you touched her you had your hands on you know, her. I, yeah, no i yeah no i said never struck her okay so you you I mean, I'm, I'm gonna go through this one more time make sure we're on the same page so you're you're pretty pissed at her from a week ago for sending you text messages do you have those text messages where she says she uh, as you put it fucked somebody I actually might have those, yeah. All right, you got your phone with you? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's pull it out and scroll through it. Let's see if we can see those. The next moment is fascinating because it symbolizes how drastically George's life is about to change. The interrogator will invade his personal space to make sure he's not deleting anything from his phone. Soon after that, she will take the phone out of his hand and place it on the table. Actions that would be completely unacceptable in almost any other circumstance. Table. There, were, there were like, I guess what you call like a, like a, a ongoing conversation, an ongoing like it's a message and it's gone. Okay. I'll leave that one. It'll leave that right in front of you. All right. Let's talk about how you you entered. Entered. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Because to put your to have put your fist. Through the door. No, I, she it's actually my been leg, I'm pretty your sure. Leg? Because that's why my leg's like this. Yeah, you're right. That was your them. leg. Yeah. How'd you get all the bruising on your hand then? This is all from the cross. This is all. That's this, pretty fresh right there, looks. This is all from my lacrosse game on Saturday. On Saturday. I mean, I wear my arm, you can see where my arm pads are. Mm -hmm. Right here, my gloves right here. and that's Even right there, I thought you, you wore those padded gloves. This is lacrosse. all. This is all the difference. This is all from lacrosse, okay. and that's. I got whacked here. I remember, hundred percent, got whacked during the game when I was trying to end, like kill the clock. Mm -hmm. When when you had her and you're shaking, did she scratch you anywhere? No. 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 She's a little girl. She's tiny. Yeah, she did not. No, she didn't. She didn't she scratch didn't try me. to hit you or anything like that. No. Okay. So you you kick in the door. Yeah, go in. that's so that that that's how I got to, yeah. Okay. And then I stuck my hand through and unlocked it, and went in there, and 
Okay. Everything else is real. The detectives leave the room for roughly three minutes. When they return, it appears Ed is given the chance to lead with a few of his own questions. I, I know we, we touched about what uh, what happened last night, but set it up for me, lead it up to me a little bit here. Why did you guys break up exactly? Why? Why? Yeah. Well, we are not, we are not from the same area. Right. And I'm going, or she wants me to New York, and I'm not exactly sure where, what I'm doing yet, but I'd like to move to San Francisco. Why'd you take her computer? I don't know. I have no idea. There's maybe maybe because there's evidence on the computer emails that you sent. No, or? there's no. I mean, you you can find you can read all the emails and right. everything back and forth. Detective Ed now asks George if he held Yardley down on the bed. He's trying to subtly set the grounds for an argument of smothering, which isn't a terrible idea, but would be disproven by the autopsy regardless. No, no. Did you fall down on top of her, you know, rest on we the ground? We were wrestling on the ground for like a little Did bit. Did you wrestle on the bed at all? No, I never like, no, never like, I mean, I shook her. No, I mean like, just kind of hold her down until she calmed down on the bed. No, if anything, that would, I mean, I mean, if, any, if anything, that would have been like on the floor. When we were on the floor, when her nose started bleeding, we were like wrestling around, and that's when her nose started bleeding. Was it pretty noisy when you all were wrestling around? No, I mean, she screaming. No, no, she, no, she was no, she was not screaming actually. I mean, if I'm cracking, kind of, if I'm cracking my head in the wall, I'm gonna be saying, "Oh, yeah, yeah." yeah. No, I mean, she was not screaming. Yeah. She should have been, probably, I mean, maybe. Yeah. She should have been, probably, I mean, maybe. I don't know. Why do you think she should have I don't know. I mean, well, she was screaming when I first, like, came into the room. She was like, no, like, I'm not talking to you. Like, get the fuck out of here, and all that. But, like... At any point before you said you, you, and this was your words, you said you tossed her on the bed, and then you left. Yeah. All right. At any point... Before that, did she lose consciousness? No. Okay. What happened after you tossed her on the bed? Did she move? Did she talk about, say what? something? I mean, I literally tossed her on the ground and turned around and... Tossed her on the ground or tossed her on the bed? On the bed. bed. I, walk, on the I walked bed. out the door. Okay. So when you tossed her back on the bed, in, in your mind, she's she was um, bleeding? But you said she was bleeding out her nose, and, and you didn't you didn't feel like you needed to call rescue. No. After that, after banging her head and no, she I, shaking I, her no. and blood coming out her nose on the floor. No. There's nothing about Kevin, like you missed anything that no one asked him right now. There's nothing okay. about like going going to get anything or going you know I don't know why I took the computer. George rambles about why there was no reason for taking the laptop for another 20 seconds, during which time Detective Reeves decides that enough information has been attained. Phase 2 is now complete, and the fate of Yardley is about to be revealed. These moments in interrogations are considered important for the purpose of gauging a suspect's response. It's believed that a sharp and sudden revelation can make it difficult to fabricate emotion. So in theory, this will cause a suspect to provide either a genuine response or a relatively obvious disingenuous response, which often comes in the pretense of shock or remorse. I mean, I guess that's where my logic was at, but that, which is... Well, I have to tell you something. I think I know why you took the computer. In the midst of what would have been a flawlessly executed moment, Detective Ed jumps back into the laptop mystery. The suspect has essentially confessed to murder. This really wasn't the time for regurgitated conjecture over a petty theft misdemeanor, which Ed was clearly being advised of once again through nonverbal communication. Why do you think? Is that right? Go ahead. Go ahead. She's dead. You killed her, George. killed her. She's dead? I think you knew that already. No, I did not. In our opinion, George is being truthful here, and we believe the interrogator feels the same way in this moment. She's dead? How the fuck is she dead? Because you killed her, George. How the fuck is she dead? Because you killed her. George appears to be going through a delayed response. It's so foreign a revelation that it's yet to sink in. Once the shock settles, he refuses to accept it, and this denial appears to be a momentary coping mechanism before the reality of the situation truly hits him, which will happen at this time in the footage. Oh my god. She's 
She's dead. Yes. She's dead. Yes. She's dead. She's dead. How? How? I already told you how. You already told us how as well. How is she dead? You just told us. Oh my god. You went in there to talk with her, but I got out of control, right, George? The detectives will now add further pressure to keep him talking. Suspects will often divulge information in these moments in the panicked attempt to save themselves, and in doing so can shut down a more credible storyline they haven't thought up yet. The alcohol got a hold of you. You kicked in her door. She started to fight with you. You punched her in the head. Or you cracked, She's not dead. You cracked She's her not head. Dead. You cracked She's her head dead. in the window or in the, in the wall. She is. She's not dead. I ain't BSing you. Right now, it's serious. I want to see. I want to see her. She's George, look at me. George. She is dead. You are not here to dance with us. You're, you're here because she's dead. The alcohol. I don't believe it. I don't believe it's it. It's true. I, dude, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I, I don't believe that she's dead. How did you, how, how I did don't you, believe that she's dead. How I she, don't believe that she's did, dead. Did you punch her? Did you hit her? How, she's, there's walk. no way she's dead. There's, she's not dead. I didn't, let's, I, let's I never let's, did anything. I didn't, I didn't, I did not, I did not. Let's, let's calm down. I did not, like, hurt her. Like, she's, she's not dead. Let's calm down. Just out of protocol, what we got to do is stand up for me, George. Go ahead and put your hands behind your back. Turn around. Relax. It's Relax. Right. You'll be all right. Tell me she's not dead. Tell me she's not dead, though. Please. Will you tell me she's not dead? Relax. Please. Will you tell me you she's not dead? You know what? I dead? wish I could tell you that, George. 22-year-old. 22. And her life is done. I can't I not do anything that, like that. Oh my god. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. I do not believe it. I do not believe it. There's no way. There's no way she could be dead. Either, either the head trauma or asphyxiation. It, well, it, there was no asphyxiation. Okay. God, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. What, was she, doing doing the, what she, was she doing the last time you saw her? She was like, she was like standing up with me. She was standing up with me. She was standing up with me, looking at me. Was she standing or hold, you were she holding her? She was standing up. up, looking at me. Okay. She's not dead. I know she's not dead. I know. Oh, 100 million times she's not dead. I did. You cannot be dead. I know. I know. I got out of hand. No, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It did not. It didn't. It didn't. And she was like, No, no, no. Like, get away from me. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to... I was like a little bit persistent. I mean, she's screaming. She should have been. I didn't kill her and leave. I didn't just. Oh my god. I didn't kill her. I did not kill her. I did not kill her. I did not. I did not. There's no way I can do it. No way. No way. I want a lawyer. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. No, there's no way. There's no way. There's no. So, where, 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 should I talk to someone? Who do you want to talk to? Anyone. A lawyer. One will get appointed to you. Okay, what do I do now? Go to jail? Yeah. All right, George, right now, I know you're, you, you know no one want to talk to us. So that's fine. I'm just letting let you know something. We're working on a search warrant right now. And what it is, is we're going to have to collect some stuff from you, like what's called a buckle swab. Okay. Why did you guys say, why did you guys come in and say you, you were searching for an assault? I never said anything about an assault. Someone, he did, you, someone came in this morning. I never mentioned to you anything, just told you we're investigating someone. Another we're investigating an assault. Do you want me to call anybody for you, George? At the start of this video, you were asked to think of what you would do in this situation. Really try and imagine what would be going through your mind in this moment, as you might just gain a restorative outlook from both knowing the answer while not having to answer this particular question. 
But there is, of course, no possible way you will gain anything close to the newfound perspective George has acquired in this moment, which unfortunately for him is no longer of use. Let me call your dad. This is, let me call it mom. Your mom? Why don't you like me to call? Is that an altar? Mm hmm. It's an altar? I don't know about that. What's your mom's name? What's her number? 301 okay. How? Did you want me to call your dad? Or just her? She'll talk. Mm -hmm. She can tell her everything. Okay. How? <laughs> I don't believe it. How? There's no way she's going to be dead. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. These next few moments are a turning point. The leg iron seemed to initiate a shift in his constitution, and his denial will completely cease from this point forward. He will continue to ask why and how, but he will no longer reject the severity of what is happening. Day, but. I ain't here the rest of my life. I'm sorry? So I ain't here the rest of my life. In this room? No, in jail. I don't know. I'm a bad guy, man. I'm just saying you were, bud. <laughs> Call my mom. I'm sorry? Call my mom. Not right now. Sir. Yeah, you do want to talk to her. And that was when you need your family the most, but. You know? George was taken to the regional jail soon after this moment. He would go on to plead not guilty to murder, and was held without bond for almost two years awaiting trial. It began on February 6, 2012. Well, testimony is now underway in the murder trial of the former UVA lacrosse player accused of killing his ex-girlfriend. For the first time, we have video of Hughley as he was led into the courtroom. Contrary to his appearance in the days that followed his arrest for the murder of 22-year-old Yardley Love, he appeared pale, frail, and gaunt. The prosecution presented a case that Hughley went to Love's apartment that night busted through her bedroom door and in some way struck her causing blunt force trauma which led to her death. We've also learned that on that night George Hughley was exchanging what were described as playful text messages with three other women. Those messages continued late into the night and even after the alleged attack. Throughout this trial Hughley has sat expressionless almost stoic at the defense table. All of that changed today as this police interview was airing. Hughley began crying was often pinching the bridge of his his nose with his hands and looking down as he listened to the sound of his own hysterical voice. I did not kill her. I did not kill her. I did not. I did not. In court Tuesday, Hughley's defense faced an uphill climb. The most riveting testimony came from former UNC lacrosse player Michael Burns, who testified that one time while visiting UVA, he heard some yelling for help from Hughley's apartment. When he opened the door, he said he found Hughley with his arm wrapped around Love's neck, choking her. Hughley then let her go, and she ran out of the room crying. A variety of medical experts took the stand this Wednesday, and they all seem to agree that love
Love's death was the result of blunt force trauma to the head. This was followed by highly distressing witness testimony from Yardley's neighbors. The noise was so loud, this was such a violent death that they heard it downstairs, two separate witnesses, <clears throat> and it sounded like a stereo crashing to the ground. And it certainly didn't help that the jury knew that she was alive for two hours before she died, indicating that if George Hughley had come to his senses, he could have gone back there, called 911, and possibly saved her life. Still, the driving argument for the defense is that George Hughley never intended to kill. They say this was all a tragic accident, that he does not deserve a life sentence, but instead a lesser charge and a second chance. Guilty of second degree murder, and you will hear the sentence momentarily. A 26 year prison term came down. George Hughley was brought to court to hear his lawyers plead for the judge to cut in half the 26 year sentence recommended by the jury. Judge Edward Hogshire did trim it back, but by just three years. The jury in this case recommended 26 years. The judge changed it to 23, probably a small difference, but, but why would he do that? It's surprising, isn't it, considering this is a woman who was beaten to death in her own bed. We think that George was convicted of a crime inconsistent with the facts, and he received a penalty inconsistent with what the evidence would require. There are no winners. Uh, in this case. With credit for the time that George Hughley has already served in jail, and if he gets time off for good behavior, he could be out in 18 years. And the family for Yardley Love has put out this statement, saying, We find no joy in other sorrow. We are relieved to put this chapter behind us. As for George, he was incarcerated at the Maximum Security Augusta Correctional Center for 10 years, and has since been transferred to a prison work camp in Richmond, where he's expected to serve out the rest of his sentence. The present consensus in the media is that George had no intention of killing Yardley, but that his 23-year sentence is still appropriate, if not lenient, and that him being drunk to any degree at the time of the murder is not an excuse, nor does it lessen the culpability of his actions to any extent. He'll be released at the age of 45, meaning he will have the second chance at life Yardley was never afforded. You can decide for yourself whether he deserves it or not. A comforting prospect to this tragedy is the nonprofit organization that arose from it. The One Love Foundation carries extremely important messages, both on social psychology and preventative education. Their website will be linked in the description of this video.